So we really need to have an honest conversation about energy, about geopolitics, and about uranium in particular. So currently there's a war going on for those who have been living under a rock uh, and don't know. 600 and almost 30 days ago, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine for the second time maybe even the third time, because first uh, they invaded Crimea and they annexed Crimea, and then they basically armed rebels in the Donbass and Luhansk region, which I count as the second invasion. And the third invasion was 630 days ago, and it was supposed to last only two days. They would depose Zelensky and then uh, put in a puppet government and whatever would happen next. Fortunately, I believe fortunately, Ukraine fought back. Ukraine said, no, we are not going to let Russia just flout all international rules and take whatever they want. We have a rules-based society. Ukraine is a sovereign nation. I regard everything that is internationally recognized as sovereign, but all of that is just the impetus for what we are talking today, because today there was another message. Uh, Zelensky said, well, listen, if you uh, are going to attack our energy infrastructure again, we will kneecap your biggest source of income. So Russia is still selling gas to European countries, despite the economic sanctions. And there is another important energy source that they are selling to the rest of the world, which is uranium. And this is what we are going to talk about. So what we have done in the West is what we've always done, uh, is, is we have basically sold off whatever we could sell off uh, in order to make more money. Uh, with Russia, it's slightly different. So what we've done with Russia is we have allowed them to build a kind of energy hegemony. At the end of the 20th century, when uh, Gerhard Schröder came to power, so he basically forged a coalition with the Greens in Germany on the promise that they could end the nuclear power industry in Germany. But to end that, uh, Gerhard Schröder basically said, listen, uh, you can have your atom exit as long as I uh, can get to build uh, gas plants. So that's how Russia basically infiltrated Europe. And then we got all the gas pipelines. And that's basically how we sold our soul to the devil. Now their influence in uranium is even bigger. So the other day, uh, Chris Kiefer shared uh, this white paper on Twitter by James Cranenstein and Garrett Wilkinson, uh, which is called Expanding U.S. Enrichment, Ending Global Dependence on Russian Nuclear Fuel, and Paving the Way for Deep Decarbonization. Now, this is something that I read with very much interest. So first, let's explain why we need enrichment. I mean, some people who are watching this video maybe don't know. There is a couple of uh, reactor types that do not need enrichment. So, for instance, the can do reactors. Uh, these are Canadian uh, built pressurized heavy water reactors. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of them in the world. If you have a non can do reactor or a non pressurized heavy water reactor, a light water reactor, which is uh, common these days, or an advanced gas cooled reactor, which is also a possibility, then this reactor runs on low enriched uranium. Low enriched uranium is uranium which the uranium 235 content because you have two isotopes of of uranium that you find in nature you have uranium 235 and you have uranium 238 and uranium 238 doesn't fission when it gets hit by a neutron and the uranium 235 does fission when it gets hit by a neutron and when a fission occurs then it emits more neutrons it emits energy and it breaks up into two parts so you need sufficient amounts of uranium 235 in your fuel in order to keep the chain reaction going generally speaking this requires about five percent of your uranium content in the fuel to be uranium-235. When you get your uranium from nature, so you get a rock which has uranium in it, generally speaking, less than 1% of that uranium is uranium-235. So in order to uh, make sure that you can make fuel out of this uranium, you first need to enrich the uranium-235 content from less than 1% up to 5%. And to do this, we use centrifuges. And the centrifuge works because you have a difference in mass. And because of the difference of mass, the, the heavier atoms go out, uh, get come out of the centrifuge sooner than the uranium-235 does. And it, if you stack these up and you make a lot of centrifuges in a row, that's the way how we can enrich uh, this fuel. 
what we call the amount of work that you need to put in to uh, a kilogram of uranium to get an amount of enriched uranium is what we call SWU. It's S-W-U. It stands for Separative Work Unit. And this is basically the measure that we are going to talk about today. So when you want to create a low enriched uranium, you generally need to put in around 7 to 9 SWU. So if, for instance, if you start with 9.813 kilograms of natural uranium, you put in 8.2 SWU and you get 1 kilogram of low enriched uranium. Now, if we look further at the data, then we see that Russia has cornered the market. Russia has 27.7 million SWU. Now, China is really investing a lot in nuclear energy. They are going to build a lot more plants. So this also means that they are building more enrichment capabilities. Now, the question is, how much SWU do you do? Now the question is, how much SWU do you need? And the answer is basically, you need 140,000 SWU SWU uh, to enrich sufficient amounts of uranium so you can fuel a one gigawatt reactor for one year. And we have around 60 million SWU available to us in a year. And if you would stick all of that uranium that you can produce with that capability into light water reactors, then you could fuel potentially 426 gigawatts today. So when we look at the number of nuclear reactors that are operational today and not suspended, because in Japan and in India, there's a lot of reactors that are suspended, and then we have about 368 gigawatts of nuclear capacity that is working today. So this means that we have about 58 gigawatts to spare. So when we look at the Russian capabilities, we see that out of the 426 gigawatts, 198 gigawatts are being powered by Russian enrichment capabilities. So the trouble is that Russia has even cornered the market in NATO countries. That's a real problem because the question is, what use are sanctions? I think that sending the message is only effective if you can truly show that you mean it. And when you still buy enriched uranium from Russia, in my opinion, you don't mean it. However, I do realize that the consequence of stopping to buy enriched uranium from Russia is having to stop some of your nuclear reactors. And, and, and this, is, this is a painful truth. So what can we do about it? What is, what is possible? And let's be perfectly clear here. Nothing is possible in a short time frame. Everything that we can do or should do or want to do is only possible in three, four, five, maybe even six years from now. So we will keep buying low enriched uranium from Russia for another half decade or so. And there's no telling when the Russians say, okay, listen, we don't need to sell low enriched uranium to you anymore because that's also a possibility we have not considered and then we are in an even bigger mess so if we stopped importing enriched uranium from russia we wouldn't do anything else so we wouldn't start new enrichment capabilities in the united states in france perhaps in the netherlands uk germany we would have to start stopping production at many nuclear power plants in europe and the united states within four years. So let's consider what we can find in the white paper, what can be found on the internet, and what can we actually do. So Orano in France announced that they will build new capabilities to enrich two and a half million SWU per year extra on top of the 7.2 million SWU that they already have. Then there's Urenco, Urenco in the Netherlands and Germany and UK. I don't know what they are planning to do. My guess is that they want to expand, but it's unsure. Now, the United United States is an interesting case here because the United States has 4.8 million SWU of enrichment capabilities, but that's not enough to produce all the low enriched uranium that they need for their own fleet. They buy enriched uranium from everybody. So the interesting bit here is that they have issued licenses to Urenco to build more enrichment capabilities in two sites. Now, these licenses are old. They've been issued 10 to 15 years ago. So if the United States really wanted to limit their dependence on Russian enrichment facilities, then they would start building enrichment facilities themselves that they have licensed. Uh, now, I don't know how quickly that can be done. Bear in mind, building an enrichment facility is not the same like building a nuclear reactor. 
it, it, it's still a pretty solid facility that you really want to have all the safety measures, etc., etc. But I've been inside the Renko and Richmond facility in the Netherlands, and it's not it's not a nuclear hardened building. It's a sturdy building, but it's not the same like a nuclear reactor. I've been inside a nuclear power plant, inside the containment building of a nuclear power plant. They don't compare. So building a uranium enrichment facility shouldn't be as hard as building a nuclear power reactor. Now, the paper also talks about laser enrichment. Now, personally, I know not enough about laser enrichment to really delve into this, but it, it turns out that there's an additional form of enrichment that we could put to work in order to create low enriched uranium. When we look at the current geopolitical situation, if you ask me what would be necessary right now, I would say first, keep your nuclear power plants operational for as long as possible, for as long as Russia allows it, basically. Make sure that you start building these enrichment capabilities and make sure that you can finish building those enrichment capabilities within four years. But if it's not possible, then try to do it in five or six years. And finally, start building new reactors because weaning ourselves off fossil fuels is as important as weaning ourselves off Russian enrichment capabilities. Yeah. So now, if you're still here, uh, welcome to the new studio. So I built this new studio uh, this week, uh, especially so I could uh, start producing more videos. Uh, the reason why I need to start producing more videos is because inflation is hitting the Netherlands hard and it's hitting my family particularly hard because I don't have an income. Uh, my wife does have an income, but it's uh, it, it's insufficient to uh, keep doing whatever we want to do. Uh, and, and listen, it's not a rich lifestyle. So... Um, so groceries are almost half of our expenditure in a year and groceries are getting more and more and more expensive by the day. Uh, so I would really appreciate it if you could become a Patreon member uh, so that I can make a little extra money so we can pay for our groceries. Thank you all for watching and have a nice day. Bye bye.